All right, we're going to get underway. Let's just uh, begin tonight by opening up with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the time to come together and to study your word. We're looking at some very difficult areas of scripture tonight, Lord. A uh, lot of confusion on these passages, a lot of consternation, anxiety. And so we pray for your help as we work our way through these passages. They are a part of your word. They have meaning. They give insight to the whole of the Bible. And they also have meaning for us as individuals. So we ask your blessing on our study this evening. May you be honored and glorified. And we don't take it for granted that we have the ability to come together, assemble, talk openly about the scriptures. We're recognizing that there are brothers and sisters across the world tonight that cannot do that. In fact, they haven't done it for years <clears throat> because of fear of retribution. So Lord, uh, may we use our freedoms well in uh, understanding your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I want to begin tonight by taking a look at uh, a picture. This is just want to go back and put a postscript on last week's lecture. Remember, we culminated that by noting the importance of Caesarea Philippi. This city is where Jesus puts the question out to the disciples, who do men say that I am? And uh, we remember the responses there. We talked about the, um, the different views of this. When Jesus says, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we talked about the Protestant understanding that. We talked about the Roman Catholics. Uh, it would have been great if I would have had this picture last week, but I thought of it after the fact, and now I'm putting it in. So if you go to Caesarea Philippi today, and you're on a tour, you're going to get to this spot. This is an area, in fact, if you look closely, you'll see people there that are tourists. They're looking at this cave. At the time of Christ, this area was dedicated to the worship of Pan. And the whole watering system that was for the city of Caesarea Philippi was actually flowing out of that cave. It's actually been redirected. It's not that way now. But it was believed that this is where they worshiped the god of Pan. And the idea was that offerings needed to be presented there. You might note on the right, you see that little arched area that's there. Um, there are a number of places that are like that. Some of them are quite a lot smaller, but they're indentations where you'd present an offering to the god, or um, there actually be an idol that'd be placed there. What you understand, what you need to see is this was considered the gate of hell. Okay, this is the whole, this part of this region. This is the foothills, Caesarea Philippi, and this area that we're talking about here is the foothills of Bashan, which leads up to Mount Hermon. We talked about that last week. So when Jesus says, upon this rock, you can see as a word picture here, the importance of the statement and the background. It is a rocky area. And you can just about imagine, I don't know if it was exactly in this spot, but nonetheless, the point would have been made to first century readers and people that were um, familiar with this territory. So I want to just begin that tonight with a little postscript and where we had been last week. Tonight we're looking at the Nephilim and the corrupted, corrupted people groups of Canaan. Many Christians have troubling moral questions over Moses' remarks concerning the annihilation of certain people groups, including animals, within Canaan. The call to clearly or utterly destroy, Deuteronomy chapter 2, is there used a number of times. The Hebrew term here for utterly destroyed that's being translated in our Bibles is the Hebrew karam, which is a technical term meaning to devote something to destruction. So I've got on the screen for you now, we're going to look at some key texts here. Deuteronomy chapter 2, this is uh, Moses here, a sermon of his, beginning at verse 34. 
So we captured all of the cities at that time and utterly destroyed. That's Karim. The men, women, children of every city. We left no survivor. We took only the animals as our booty and spoil of the cities which we had captured. Again, later on, Deuteronomy chapter 20. When you approach a city, this is instruction now, chapter 2, Moses is talking about what they did in the Transjordan. We're going to deal with that tonight a little bit more deeply. In chapter 20, he's giving instructions once they go across the Jordan in to possess the remainder of the promised land. Verse 10, when you approach a city to fight against it, you shall offer it terms of peace. If it agrees to make peace with you and opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall become your forced labor and shall serve you. However, if it does not make peace with you, but makes war against you, you shall besiege it. When the Lord your God gives it into your hand, you shall strike all the men in it with the edge of the sword. Only the women and the children and the animals and all that is in the city, all its spoil, you shall take as your booty for yourself. And you shall use the spoil of your enemies which the Lord your God has given you. Now listen. Thus you shall do to all the cities that are very far from you which are not the cities of these nations nearby. Only in the cities of these peoples that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, you shall not leave alive anything that breathes. But you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may not teach you to do according to all the detestable things which they have done for their gods, so that you would sin against the Lord your God. You'll know particularly in this passage, verse 15, peace terms are only being offered to cities that are far away. Cities near to the promised land are to remain with nothing left that breathes. Verse 16. Women and children were not killed in certain places, but this was not the case for the cities of the Amorites and the Canaanites. These passages that we're looking at this evening has caused a great deal of emotional anxiety for many Christians because they don't know how to process this with the understanding that God is a God of love. You know, you can't put the two together. The pagans are right on the tails of that. I mean, this is an area where we have the forces of darkness, I would argue, in the form of various writers that write against Christianity and to a lesser extent Judaism because of these passages. Richard Dawkins is an example of that, evolutionary biologist. He writes in the book, The God Delusion, he states it this way, the ethnic cleansing begun in the time of Moses is brought to bloody fruition in the book of Joshua, a text remarkable for the bloodthirsty massacres it records and the xenophobic relish with which it does so, end quote. So Christianity is being, has been pummeled, has been, is, and will be over passages like this regarding them being in the Word of God. This lesson tonight will deal with the reason why the order of Karim was required by God. That's my objective when we're done. The utter destruction of human life is once again highlighted by Moses. It's, here we have it, Deuteronomy chapter 3, additional text here, starting at verse 3. So the Lord your God delivered Og also, king of Basan, with all his people into our hand, 
and we smote them until no survivor was left. We utterly destroyed them. So we did to Sion, king of Heshbon, utterly destroying the men, the women, and the children in every city. Now see, some people would come along and say, Don, I can understand these people groups were involved in not only just paganism, but the outward worship of these gods, which was an affront to the Most High God. But why is it so harsh that it, it, you're being, this is being taken out even on the kids? This is the argument that's used here. Now, the references here in Deuteronomy chapter 3, this is Moses articulating what had happened while he was still alive, the Transjordan campaign. We talked about that last week. Everything on the eastern side of the Jordan River, and there were a number of giant clans that were in that region who had already been destroyed, utterly destroyed, by the descendants of Lot and Esau. Joshua, he's making this note here in Deuteronomy chapter 3. But that leads us down to Joshua chapter 10. This is where it gets really descriptive. There, in chapter 10, verses 28 to 43, we're not going to read the whole section, but I'll give you a summary statement. In that section, two phrases are heavily utilized in this portion of the Scripture. The phrasing, left no survivor, is used six times. The term, utterly destroyed, carom, literally put under the ban, is used four times. And again, that's what carom means, to put under the ban. Anything that was under the ban was to be utterly destroyed. And here we have the summary statement. You'll see it on the screen, verse 40 of Joshua 10. Thus Joshua struck all the land, the hill country, and the Negev, and the lowlands, and the slopes, and their kings. He left no survivor, but he utterly destroyed all who breathe, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. So it's also being clear here, this isn't something where Joshua kind of went off half-cocked. It wasn't something like, well, maybe he misinterpreted what Moses said. The text is very clear. This is something that the Most High God has ordered. <clears throat> You'll note that when you see the phrasing, the hill country, this is dealing with the northern region of the Promised Land. When you see the phrase, the Negev, that is the southern region of the Promised Land. The targeted people groups were quite specific. The Promised Land was noted as Canaan, but not all the people who lived there were truly Canaanites, as if they descended from Ham, uh, from Ham's son, Canaan. The books of Numbers and Joshua make a clear distinction between Canaanites who live by the sea and the Jordan River and other groups that were living in the lands. All of these references are in my notes. Look on the screen. Joshua 11 highlights the northern campaign. Note specifically verse 21. Then Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from hill country from Hebron, from Deber, from Anab, and from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel, Joshua utterly destroyed their cities. Now, you should be familiar with that term. We've run into it now for several weeks. Anakim is a designation of the result of these sons of God that copulated with human women and spawned a race. We talked about that. And that uh, they're known as these Anakim. We are, will cover every single designation for them tonight. And they're all the same. They all have the same root. By comparing the conquered groups in Joshua 10 and Joshua 11 with the names and places described in Numbers 13, we can understand why the Karim order was carried out. Numbers 13, it's on the screen, selected portions. 
Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Now, this is the report coming back from the spies much earlier. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev, and the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, they're all on the hill country, and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report on the land, which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone in, in spying it out, is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw were men of great size. There also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Joshua, simply put, was to exterminate the Anakim and every single region that they were located in within the Promised Land. Joshua chapter 11, beginning at verse 21, on the screen. Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron to Deber, Anab, and from the hill country of Judah, and from the hill country of Israel. Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. Verse 22, there were no Anakim left in the land of the sons of Israel, only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. Some remained. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to the divisions of their tribes. Thus, the land had rest from war. Okay, so the hill country of Judah refers to the southern campaign. The hill country of Israel describes the northern campaign. And I give you those two designations there. That is indicating that there probably was a final edit on the book of Joshua later because those references were not in existence at the time when they took the land initially. So there's probably a later edit. And at that time, people understood those regions for southern and northern would make all the sense in the world. Now, again, a, f a later edit doesn't mean that's not causing problems with the inspiration of the Scripture. You know, the, the accuracy of it is what was detailed. It's written down there, and you have men coming along that are editorializing the works that are there. I don't see a, a big conflict with that. Joshua chapter 11, verse 22, there were no Anakim left in the land of the sons of Israel, only in Gaza and Gath and Ashdod remain. Question, why this note? Why is that in there? These are the areas that will become the cities of the Philistines. They will become the arch enemies of Israel. If you know your Old Testament history, going through Chronicles and Kings, Samuel, etc., you're going to see that interface with these people groups. This sets the stage, that comment sets the stage for the final annihilation of the giant bloodlines under David. What, what, what wasn't done completely at the time of the conquest would be picked up later on. You remember Goliath? Where was he from? Gath. And his brothers as well. 2 Samuel chapter 21, beginning at verse 15. Now, when the Philistines were at war with Israel, David went down and his servants with him as they fought against the Philistines. David became weary. Then Ishben Benad, who was among the descendants of the giant, the weight of whose spear was 300 shekels of bronze in weight, was girded with a new sword and intended to kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, helped him and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall not go out again with us in battle 
so that you do not extinguish the lamp of Israel. So what's going on here is, it was close. David almost got killed. And he has people that are loyal to him in the army, but he has several of them that are his mighty men. They are like his personal guard. Uh, they're highlighted in the scripture as well. And they're basically getting him by the collar of his shirt and saying to him, you're not going to go. You're not going to go into these battles with us anymore. It's too dangerous. You could be put to death. Let us do it. And that's exactly what they did. We pick it up. Now it came about after this that there was war again with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sebakai and Hashathite struck down Saf, who was among the descendants of the giant. There was war with the Philistines again at Gob. And Elahan, the son of Jair, Oram, and the Bethelamite killed Goliath the Gittite. That's not the same Goliath. The shaft whose spear was like a weaver's beam. There was war at Gath again, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number, and he also had been born to the giant. When he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, struck him down. These four were born to the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Following the time of David, the giants disappear from the word of God. Numbers 13, verse 33. There also, this is part of the spies, there also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so were in their sight. Now commentators often ignore the words of Moses on this text, but clearly, as previously noted, the spies saw giants in the promised land. What you need to understand is this is the strategic battle plan of the arch enemy of the Most High to either destroy or to uh, corrupt the line of David, which would bring forth the line of Christ. Remember, it's a twofold plan. First, kill the seed of the woman, and if you can't kill it, then pollute it. That's the plan. Numbers 13, beginning of verse 21. And so they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin, as far as Rehob, to Lebo Hathmath. When they had gone into the Negev, they came to Hebron, where Ahamin. Shashai and Talami, the descendants of Anak, were there. Now, Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Now, that text is outlining giants. And you may be sitting there and saying, hey, John, I heard you say that. I looked at it on the screen. I don't see any giants present. They're there. Ahamin, Shashai, Shashai and Talami. They're all descendants of Anak. Anak means giant or long neck. The sense is they were Anakim. Remember that the Anakim are giants. Some of your Bibles will actually call them Anakites. The Anakim were giants and therefore Nephilim. Now, there's a, the interesting thing here regarding the parenthetical thought. In parentheses, the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim in Numbers 13.33. Uh, what's interesting here is that parentheses is not in the Septuagint. Okay? Now, you remember, 
The Septuagint, abbreviated by LXX, is the Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew. It is the text that was in place 250 years before the time of Christ and the apostles. It is the Bible, in most cases, that was being used by Jesus and the apostles. No doubt about it. That parenthesis isn't in there, okay? Now, the Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew, okay, it takes in all these Hebrew fragments. It begins around the first century A.D. It reaches its final edit around the eighth century. We've talked about this. What's interesting is that the thought is that either Moses or more than likely a later editor inserted the parentheses so that the reader would know these guys are from the Nephilim. The additional parenthetical thoughts are found elsewhere when Anak or his father Arba are mentioned. And the New King James Version makes this point obvious on the screen. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kirjath Arba. Parentheses, Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. That's Joshua 14. Next one. Now to Caleb, he gave a share among the children of Judah, namely Kerjoth Arba, which is Hebron. Arba, parentheses, was the father of Anak. Again, uh, Joshua 21. And they gave them Kerjoth Arba, parentheses. Arba was the father of Anak, which is in the Hebron. And finally, Judges chapter 1. Then Judah went against the Canaanites who dwelt in Hebron, parentheses. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kerjath Arba. And they killed Shashai, Amin, and Natalami there. All three of those giant clans as well. Joshua 15 verse 13 says, Note that Arba was Anak's father. Arba being the father and ancestor was a giant because Joshua 14.15 categorically states, quote, Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Okay? Now, oh, here's the importance of this. If this is an editorialized comment, the parentheses, this is being added by the Hebrew creators of the Masoretic text later on because it's not in the Septuagint, which was earlier, which means that is how they interpreted it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Everybody follow that. Do you have any questions on that? In other words, it's that parentheses is not in the earliest form of the Septuagint, the Greek translation, but it's in the Masoretic text, which is coming later. So that being the case, it means even the framers of the Masoretic text felt we got to qualify this to make sure the reader understands who these guys are. Now I want you to note the location of the giant clans. They were located in the following cities. Gaza, Gath, Ashdod, Hebron, Ammon, Bashan, Moab, Lachish, Eglon, Jerusalem, and Jarmuth, as, as, as well as other city sites. Take a look at the map. Okay, this is a great map. A lot of things I want to call to your attention there. First is this, it made me smile on this. So, so let, me tell you, let me tell you how great my, my faithful scribe is, <laughs> Debbie Laurel. Sometimes I'll say to Debbie, uh, and this guy has a long history, I'd say to her, Debbie, I need a map of such and such an area. See what you can come up with. She'll come up with two or three. I'll look at them, I'll pick one, and I'll, I'll, I'll take it, okay? Other times I'd say to her, look, I want you to go and find this particular map. It's at this address, I wanna use this, this one here. In this case, this is the one she came up with. I want you to note the creators of the map. Look at the left-hand corner, what do they call it? Okay, we didn't put that in there. Okay, now let's take a look at that map. We're gonna start at the far right-hand corner. You'll note here the people groups at the bottom. Moab, as you move north, Amnon, okay? If you went south of Moab, which isn't on the map, 
This would be the area of Edom. Edom was the result of Esau. Okay, Moab and Amnon is the result of the incestuous relationship between Lot and his two daughters. Everybody with me? These are those three people groups. Moses specifically says to them, we're going up this way, but I'm not giving you their land. And do not harass them. Why? Because they killed all of the Anakim. All three of those people groups annihilated these giant clans. So, but they're not done. The nation of Israel, and I have other maps to show you this, on that right-hand side or the eastern side of the Jordan River, um, they will be given land on that, but not going into the land of Amnon and Moab. There is a portion there. It continues to go north. But before they could do any of that, they went straight north and look where they came to. The kingdom of Og. Okay? This is right. You see Bashan at the top. Right? This is where they dealt with these two Anakim kings up there and killed them and the people groups. That's the Transjordan campaign. That had to be done before they would cross the Jordan. Moses was there for this, but when they cross the Jordan, Moses isn't, and he's giving them instructions to head in to Jericho as they go across the Jordan. So these cities, along with the regions of Ammon, Bashan, and Moab, were perfectly situated, listen carefully, to block any attempt by the Israelites to enter the promised land, whether from the south or the east. The plan of the enemy was strategic. Now, this next part is very important. I'm going to highlight for you now every single name that is found in the scripture that identifies these giant clans. Okay? <clears throat> now, before I do that, I'll make this comment. Two weeks in a row, I introduced you a, a term that for most of you haven't heard before, the Apkalu. Apkalu is the term that is used in Babylonian texts that go back in time to the same period dealing with Genesis chapter 6, 1 to 4, with a very similar story that went on there. Except they're not called Nephilim. They use the word Apkalu. Not only Apkalu for those that came down out of heaven, copulated with women, but their prodigy was that, called an Apkalu as well. That is an extra biblical term. Every one of the terms I'm going to give you right now are biblical. They're in your Bibles. Okay? It's Monday night. You guys all worked all day. And I know I'm going to start reading these names off, and you're going to be like cross-eyed and like, hey, Don, you know, it's 6.30 at night, I'm, I'm, I'm knocked out here. These are terms in your own Bible, okay? You will understand what I'm saying tonight more if you take this home, you look at these passages of Scripture, read them in your own Bibles, you've got to study it a little bit. Get my notes, print them off, read through that. Here we go. Number one. Did, Did you, you include that map in your notes? Because that would be really helpful. I have the map in my notes. Okay. Number one. Nephilim. Mentioned first in Genesis 6, 1 to 4, which we previously examined. They were the mighty men of antiquity, men of renown. Additionally, they were the offspring of the sons of God. Okay. The spies said the people of the land are, quote, strong and descendants of Anak, Numbers 13, verse 28. They were of great size, Numbers 13, 32. The spies were like grasshoppers compared to them, Numbers 13, 33. This is obviously an exaggeration, I would say, but Moses said nothing to dispute the report. They lacked faith in God, but the report was accurate. They were extraordinarily big. Number two, Raphaim. Raphaim. They are first mentioned in Genesis. The text reveals a battle in which four kings went to war against five kings. We pick it up, Genesis 14, beginning at verse 5. 
In the 14th year of Chedorlaomer, I had a hard time with that. I've worked on that all day. And the kings that were with him came and defeated the Raphaim in Ashtoreth, Carmen, and the Zuzim, Zuzim in Ham, and the Emin, and in Shevath, Kareth, Harim, and the Horites in Mount Sir, as far as Alpara, which is in the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to Imispath, that is Kadesh, and conquered all the country of the Amalekites and the Amorites who lived in Hazar. Now, four of these people groups are later described as giants. Yet at this time, the giants are on the losing side of the battle. The Raphaim are noted here. This is the most common word used in the scripture to describe giants of the Old Testament. Again, the most common word to describe giants in our Old Testament is the word Raphaim. It is possible that it's just another word that means giants. The basis for this point is because the singular form Rapha is used to describe a particular giant from Gath in 2 Samuel 21. Nonetheless, the term more likely refers to a specific group of giants as in the case of Genesis 14 and later where the Raphaim are distinguished from the Amorites and other people groups. Example, Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 8. Thus we took the land at that time from the hand of the two kings of the Amorites. Who were they? Who were beyond the Jordan from the valley of Arnon to Mount Hermon. The Sidonians call Hermon Siron, and the Amorites call it Sinir. All the cities of the plateau and all of Gilead and all of Bashan as far as Selak and Adre, the cities of the kingdom of Og of Bashan. For only Og, king of Bashan, was left of the remnant of the Raphaim. Behold, his bedstead was an iron bedstead. It is at Rehobah and the sons of Ammon. Its length was nine cubits. Its width was four cubits by ordinary cubit. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Now, this reference is again to the Transjordan campaign before they crossed the Jordan. They're dealing with everything on that right-hand side of the map or the eastern side of Jordan that was not conquered by uh, the uh, descendants of Lot or Esau. They went further north. They got to Bashan. There were two kings they had to deal with there where they're being noted. Obviously, they were a people group, the Raphaim. There is also here a Eucharist connection as well. Okay? The Bible is not only ancient writing of, of reference to the Raphaim, Raphaim in the land of Canaan. Tim Chaffee is writing on this. He says, three ancient fragmentary fat tablets have been found among the Eucharistic material in modern day Syria. We've talked about Eucharist. They are titled the Raphaim. In these writings, the Raphaim are called gods and divine ones and are also considered to be deceased ancestors who have been deified posthumously. Raphaim were indeed giants. Deuteronomy notes that the Anakim were considered Raphaim. Here are the texts. Let's look at it. Deuteronomy 2, verse 11. Like the Anakim, they are also regarded as Raphaim. But the Moabites call them Emin. See how this can be confusing. We got different names for some of the same groups, but they're all of the same bloodline. That's why it's proper to use giant clans. Chapter 2, verse 20. It is also regarded as the land of the Raphaim. For the Raphaim formerly lived in it, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumim. 
Again, chapter 3, verse 13 of Deuteronomy, the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, the kingdom of Og, I gave to the half-tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Argob concerning all Bashan. It is called the land of the Raphaim. Now, I'm going to pause here. I was trying to think how I can get this across to you guys and to eliminate the confusion as best I can. I hope this works. I mean, you know, I was taught in seminary, illustrations are like a three-legged dog. You know, they get there, but not always in the best fashion. I hope, I hope this does it. I want you to think about automobiles for a minute. We got all different kinds of cars, right? We got, we got Mercedes-Benz, you know, we got... We got General Motors, we got Fiat, we got Chrysler, we got Ford, you know, we have Honda, Nissan, Kia. I mean, we have all these different cars, lines, and then we have all of these different kinds of models that are part of that. Okay, they're all cars, right? But suppose I say, well, let's specifically talk about General Motors. Okay, so now, we've narrowed the focus down to a specific manufacturer. And I said, well, what, what cars would be a part of that line? Well, we're talking about cars like Buicks, Chevrolet, Cadillac. There might be one or two other ones in there. Those guys, these car lines, have one specific manufacturer. The giant clans that we're looking at have one specific manufacturer. Their lineage is separated out. They're not the same as the other people groups. They're different. They go by different model names. Emim, Raphaim, Anakim, okay? But they've got the same parent company. You with me? The conquest for the promised land failed to eliminate all of the Anakim and some remained, as we've already noted, in the Philistine cities of Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. Da David will later defeat the giant Goliath, who was a descendant of Anakim Raphaim. He had brothers too, and Chronicles notes the final extermination. Pick it up, 1 Chronicles chapter 20. Now it came about after this that war broke out in Gezer with the Philistines. Then Sebekai, the Hashhathite, killed Sapai, one of the descendants of the giants, and they were subdued. And there was war with the Philistines again. And Alanan, the son of Jair, killed Lami, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Again, there was war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature who had 24 fingers and toes, six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. He also was descended from the giants. When he taunted Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother killed him. These were descended from the giants in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Now, there's also a connection of the Raphaim to Hades. Michael Heiser writes on this point, he says, there are nearly 10 references in the Old Testament to a place known as the Valley of the Raphaim. On several occasions, the Philistines are described as camped there. He gives the references. And tells us that the Valley of the Raphaim adjoined another valley, the Valley of Hanan. In Hebrew, the Valley of Henan is Gehenan, from which we get the word Gehenna. 
By the time of the New Testament, Gehenna became a designation for the fiery realm of the dead, hell or Hades. This valley was the site where King Ahaz and King Manasseh sacrificed their own sons to burn offerings to Moloch, 2 Chronicles chapter 28. The sacrifices took place at ritual centers called topoleths, burning places. And later the Valley of Hanan was referred to as the place of the topoleth. Now, when you go to Israel and you're studying Jerusalem, what you find is the city sits in the center of two major valleys the Kidron Valley, and the Henan Valley. By the time of the New Testament, that valley, which has all of this connotation of being connected to evil, uh, sacrifices, kids being burned up, being on fire, it was a garbage dump. And so by the time of Christ, there's always smoke, and there's flames going up in this valley. And it was associated with hell. This is the connection with these Raphaim. It's interplayed, connected with this of what they're all about. There's an additional connection to Molech and the city of Eucharist. A further notation on this, Molech's name appears in two snake charms from Eucharist in connection with the city of Ashtoreth the place known for the biblical accounts of the, the king Og. Another Eucharitic text puts the Gog Rapu, the patron deity of the Raphaim, in Ashtoreth as well. These texts, at the very least, inform us that there was a close religious association between Molech and the Raphaim. Heiser writes, this makes sense in light of the geographical relationship between the valley of the Raphaim and the valley of Henan. They're all about this. When you talk about hell or the flames of hell, it's endemic in, in, in this, this people group. But the term Raphim also occurs as departed spirits. It may be a designation for spirits of dead Nephilim giants. Do we have any examples of that? Yeah, we do. Psalm 88, verse 10. I don't have these on the screen. Just listen to them. Psalm 88.10. Will you perform wonders for the dead? Will departed spirits rise and praise you? The term is Raphaim. Departed spirits. Same word. Again, Proverbs 21, verse 16. A man who wanders from the way of understanding will rest in the assembly of the dead. Raphaim, same word. Isaiah 14, verse 9. Sheol from beneath is excited over you to meet you when you come. It arouses for you the spirits of the dead. Raphaim. Isaiah 26, verse 14. The dead will not live the departed spirits will not rise. It's the Raphaim, again. Raphaim may be translated as shades, we talked about that last week, or ghosts, or just the dead. The reason for the different entry is likely due to the fact that the entities are found in Sheol and are generally spoken of to remind the reader of how horrifying death will be for the wicked. It is possible that these Raphaim, writes uh, Tim Chaffee, that these Raphaim are the spirits of the deceased giants. I think that's exactly what they are. What are they, where do they go? When they die, what happens to them? Well, they're out roaming around. That's what's happened. They're stuck. They're, they're not from heaven, and they're not from earth. The only thing they know experientially is to be housed in a human body. That's it. The Dead Sea Scroll calls them bastards. Raphaim. All right? What about number three? Zamzumin or Zuzim? Your eyes crossing yet? Okay, Zamzumin and Zuzem. 
designated as another giant clan. Here we've got it. It's on the screen. Deuteronomy 2, verse 20. It is also regarded the land of the Raphaim, for the Raphaim, Raphaim formerly lived in it, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumim. See, what, what car do you drive? Oh, I, 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 I drive General Motors. Someone else says, oh, I drive... I drive a Buick. Someone else says, well, I drive an Enclave. They're all the same. Different names. <coughs> Zuzem is just another for, name for Zamzumin. It's abbreviated. Moses refers to this group while noting that the Ammonites pre previously annihilated them. Therefore, Israel is to pass through the region of Amnon. Deuteronomy 2, 18. Today you cross over Ar, the border of Moab. When you come opposite the sons of Ammon, do not harass them or provoke them. For I will not give you any of the land of the sons of Ammon as a possession, because I have given it to the sons of Lot as a possession. It is also regarded as the land of the Raphaim. For the Raphaim formerly lived in it, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumin. See the same. A people as great and numerous and as tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them before them, and they dispossessed them and settled in their places, just as he did for the sons of Esau, who lived in Sarah when he destroyed the Horites from them before them and they dispossessed them and settled in their place. Number four, Eman, Eman. I noted this first up, Genesis chapter 14, they are Raphaim, but the Moabites call them Emim. The height of both the Emim and the Zumim are compared to the Anakim. They're all the same, the different names. What about the Horites, number five? Also noted in Deuteronomy 22, directly after describing the Zamzumin and the Emim, they are not specifically referred to as giants or tall, but are listed with two other giant clans. They are listed also in Genesis 14, right after the name Raphaim. Zuzim, Emim, they in context probably indicates that they were giants too, and they were eradicated by the descendants of Esau. Consequently, Israel didn't bother them. Number six, another term, same group, Anakim. In Numbers 13, it details, is given, that the spy saw three groups that were descendants of Anak in Hebron. They are named as Ahim, Ahimen, Sheshai, and Talamar. Numbers 13, 22. Also note that Moses compares the height of the Zamzumim and the Emim to the Anakim. Anakim are also identified as Raphaim. Here we go. Deuteronomy chapter 2, uh, verse 10. The Emim lived there formerly, a people as great and numerous and as tall as the Anakim. Like the Anakim, they're regarded as Raphaim, but the Moabites call them Emim. Same group, same people. Look at Deuteronomy 2, verse 21. A people great and numerous and as tall as the Anakim, but the Lord destroyed them before them. Now, some of the Anakim remained after the conquest. We have that note in Joshua chapter 11, 21. I don't have it on the screen. I'll read it to you. Then Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron, from Debir, from Anab, from all the city in the hill country of Judah, from the hill country of Israel. Joshua utterly destroyed their cities. There were no Anakim left in the land of the sons of Israel, only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. The three cities named here become strategic, as we've already noted. David's mighty men defeated more of these giants at Gath. They were connected to the Philistines. Finally, in regards to the Anakim, note that the Egyptians knew of the Anakim, and they feared them. 
The Egyptians cursed their enemies through a process similar to a voodoo doll. Okay, you know, they make a doll of the person and then you stick knives in it and all this, try to make these bad things happen. They would make a jar or a figurine with its arms tied behind its back. Then they wrote the names on the figurine along with some curses, and then they would smash the clay to pieces. Clyde Billington, in his uh, remarks on this, on Goliath and the Exodus giant, he writes this. Four of these clay fragments, now known as excreation text, include the Egyptian name for Anakim. Same word. The name appears in the list of enemies that included other people groups from in and around the land of Canaan. Finally, Amorites. Amorites. This is another people group listed among other giant clans, but nothing is said of their height. However, a revelatory note concerning their height occurs much later. Like, what is it with the Amorites? I mean, we don't have anything. There's nothing in Deuteronomy. We don't have anything in Joshua. I mean, what about these guys? I mean, they're right mixed in with all of them. We have to wait, 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 wait for more biblical revelation centuries later. And there you have it. Amos, chapter 2, verse 9. Amos looks back on this, and God is recounting the conquest, and we have it this way. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them. Though his height was like the height of cedars, and he was as strong as an oak. I even destroyed his fruit above and his root below. It was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you in the wilderness 40 years that you might pos take possession of the land of the Amorite. Note the language here. It was I who brought you up even before that. I even destroyed his fruit above and his root below. If you're going to deal with weeds in your yard, you need something that's going to kill the root. Otherwise, they're coming back. Why were there no terms given? Why can't we win these people over? Okay? We can't win them over. They're not human. In the beginning, God created man, male and female. Okay. There's a genetic code. In spite of everything you hear about transgenderism, you can't change the genetic code for being human and being a female or being a male. These guys don't fit. They don't fit. There can be no truce. There can be no treaty. And we don't want the danger of them intermarrying with the bloodline. Furthermore, we noted Sion and Og, those two kings in the Transjordan, they were both kings over the Amorites, and one is identified as a Raphaim. Raphaim, Joshua chapter 2, verse 10. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you, and when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. Language there, carom, they were under the ban. Annihilated. Again, chapter 12, verse 4 of Joshua, the territory of Og, king of Bashan, one of the remnant of the Raphaim. The context of Amos' comment is about the exodus and the conquest of Canaan. The Amorites, at least for some of them, is synonymous with the Canaanites. They were descended from the Nephilim. This would mean to an Israelite that the population to be conquered was part of the supernatural war between Yahweh and the pagan gods. This is the backstory. Okay, the front story is what's going on to acquire the land. But the backstory is God going to war with these gods that had been in rebellion and, in fact, spawned off a race of freaks that become part of the powers of darkness plan to destroy the seed of the woman. Keep in mind that Og, a king of the Amorites, ruled Bashan, 
Deuteronomy chapter 3. Also, Moses noted the unusual, the unusual size of Og's bed, which is probably a casket before it was prepared for death. It's interesting to note, Heiser has a remark on this. He said, the dimensions of his bed are precisely those of the cultic bed in a ziggurat called Ekertamaki, which most archaeologists identify as the Tower of Babel. We will be dealing with the Tower of Babel in depth in the month of March. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11. For only king of Bashan, it's on the screen, was left of the remnant of the Raphaim. Behold, his bedstead was an iron bedstead. It is at Reba, the sons of Ammon. Its length was nine cubits. Its width was four cubits by ordinary cubit. One cubit is approximately 18 inches. Hence, we're looking at 13.5. Okay, so those are the names. Those are the names. Now, what about the battle plan? Okay, there's a specific battle plan to destroy the giants. So 40 years earlier, God brought the Israelites to the border of the promised land. This would have been for a probable southern entrance campaign. Now, the second generation of Jews will head out alongside of Canaan, tracking north. So we're 40 years later. Why? Because there, there wasn't any faith on the part of the original people. They're, they're too big. We're not going to deal with them. There was no confidence in God. God says, fine, I'm going to judge you for that. Every single adult is going to die in that wilderness. So the second generation are the ones that are picking up the, taking up the weapons are getting ready to go in and make this conquest. The second generation of Jews will head out alongside of Canaan tracking north. The territory they would traverse was the eastern side of Canaan known as the Transjordan. See the map? There it is. All right, take a look at that map. Now, we're focusing on the eastern side of the Jordan River or to the right side of the map. You'll notice the land of Moab at the bottom. Now, on this map, Amnon is not noted but it would be positioned there just south of the Jabbok River. So Moab is present, Amnon is present, but the land that's closest to the river, this is given to Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. And this isn't a conflict with those other people groups because they're not, their land doesn't go all the way up to the Jordan River. So they already annihilated Moab, Amnon, annihilated all the giant clans there. Transjordan campaign first had to go all the way up on that side. Bashan is not listed to be at the top of the map. Deal with Og and Sion. And then at the conclusion of the campaign, those tribes would live on that side of the Jordan River. So right off the bat, you understand, I mean, Israel has nowhere near the territorial land that they were originally given. All of that right now is Jordan, modern day Jordan. Deuteronomy chapter two, eight to 23. So we passed beyond our brothers, the sons of Esau, who lived in Seir, away from Arabah road, away from Eloth and from Ezion to Geber. And we turned and passed through by the way of wilderness to, of Moab. Then the Lord said to me, do not harass Moab, nor provoke them to war, for I will not give you any of their land as a possession, because I have given Ar to the sons of Lot as a possession. The Emim, we've heard that before, lived there formerly, a people great and numerous, as the tall as the Anakim, and like the Anakim, they're also regarded as the Raphaim, but the Moabites call them Emim. The Horites formerly lived in Seir, but, the es uh, but Esau, the sons of Esau, dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and settled in their place, just as Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave to them. Now arise, cross over the brook Zered yourselves. So we crossed over the brook Zered. 
Now the time that it took for us to come from Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook Zered was 38 years until all the generation of men of war perished from within the camp as the Lord had sworn to them. Moreover, the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from within the camp until they all perished. So it came about when all the men of war had finally perished from among the people that the Lord spoke to me saying, today you shall cross over Ar, the border of Moab. And when you come opposite the sons of Ammon, do not harass them nor provoke them. For I will not give you any of the land of Amnon as a possession because I have given it to the sons of Lot as a possession. It is also regarded the land of the Raphaim for the Raphaim formerly lived in it but the Ammonites called them Zamzumin, a people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim, but that the Lord destroyed them before them, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place. Just as the sons of Esau, who live in Seir, when he destroyed the Horites before them, they dispossessed them and settled in their place even to this day. And the Avim, who lived in the villages of Gaza, and Katatorum, who came from Katfor, uh, destroyed them and lived in their place. What we're learning is this. The Edomites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites were to be left unmolested in the Transjordan campaign. They have lineage with Abraham, but they are outside of the covenant people of God. Nonetheless, God allotted their land to Lot, Abraham's nephew, and Esau, Jacob's brother. Giants once lived in these territories. The giant clans known in the region were the Emim, the Zamzumim. The Moabites and the Ammonites drove out the Horites, the Avim, and the Kaphorim. The latter three are not known as giant clans, but they are nonetheless aligned with these groups. The Edomites... The Moabites and the Ammonites had previously dealt with all of these groups. Look on the screen. Here's Joshua's southern campaign. You see it on the screen there. You see where Gaza is on the far left? Ascalon, Ashdod, Gath. That region, this is where the giants will retreat to. This is the only place left for them to go. Everything else gets conquered, and they go into those areas, and the Israelites let them go. It will be later, it will be David's mighty men that will deal with them. Then there's Joshua's northern campaign. Next map. You see that there. So after the war, after the victories over Sion and Og, Moses died. This is the Transjordan campaign. The conquest began at Jericho, okay, a central military campaign would have immediately had the effect of separating the cities from the north from those in the south. Divide and conquer. The southern campaign is described in Joshua chapter 10, 28 to 43. Six editorial comments are used. Left, nothing remaining. The Anakim were known to live in this region. We know that from Numbers 13. Other groups, people groups who live there were under threat. I noted in my notes, wrong place, wrong time. Every time there's a war, there are unintended consequences with some people groups. I mean, look what's going on right now in Israel. This is the whole thing they're talking about in regards to a lot of the people that live in Gaza that really aren't a part of the, the battle, but they're getting killed. Every single war in the history of the world has this problem where civilians are killed, wrong people, Wrong place, wrong time. Some of that happened. Not a lot, but it did. The northern campaign is described in Joshua 11, and the logic of Karam emerges again. Chapter 11, beginning at verse 21, it's on the screen. Then Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron, from Deber, from Anab, and from the hill country of Judah. And from all the hill country of Israel, Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. There were no Anakim left in the land of the sons of Israel, only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. 
So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had commanded and spoken to Moses. And Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions and their tribes. Then the land had rest from its war. So Anakim are the target because they were known to live in the land. The hill country of Judah refers to the southern campaign, while the hill country of Israel refers to the northern campaign. I noted for you that the editorial notation confirms that the writing of Joshua probably took place at a later time. It is of note that Joshua encountered warriors from nearby Mount Hermon in the region of Bashan. Karim was carried out. You've got it on the screen. Chapter 11, Joshua. The Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel so that they defeated them and pursued them as far as Great Sidon and, can't pronounce that name, and the Valley of Mitzvah to the east, and they struck them until no survivor was left. Again, verse 12, Joshua captured all the cities of these kings and all their kings, and he struck them with the edge of the sword and utterly destroyed them. That's the Hebrew, Karim just as Moses' the servant had commanded. The logic of Karim emerges in this chapter. Again, chapter 11 at 21. Then Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron, Deber, Anab, from all the hill country of Judah, from the hill country of Israel. Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. There were no Anakim left in the land of the sons of Israel. Again, you see that note, only in Gaza and Gath and Ashdod. Anakim were the target. The Karim designation is only employed for assaults in cities and locales that overlap giant populations. This wasn't indiscriminate. To utterly destroy involved these giant clans in specific cities and specific regions. The only argument that can be made for indiscriminate killing is found in Deuteronomy chapter 7, 1 and 2. I don't have this on the screen, just listen to it. When the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Gershgadites, the Amorites, Canaanites, the Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, seven nations greater and larger than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them before you and you defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them and show them no favor. I think Heiser is particularly good on this point. He notes, this passage calls for indiscriminate carom because of the indiscriminate nature of Numbers chapter 13. The words of Moses, he writes, in Deuteronomy 7 reflect the report Moses had received 40 years earlier. Its meaning is not that all the inhabitants of the land are put under Karim because everyone is a giant. Its meaning is that wherever they are found, that is giants, the bloodline of the giant clans, descendants of the Nephilim, are to be eradicated. Once the conquest of Canaan actually begins, this is indeed how the term is used in reports of the Israelite victories. Once again, the object of the military campaign was to eradicate any vestiges of the descendants who were the result of an unholy union between lesser Elohim and human women. Their evil ways had come to an end and no seed of the serpent would be permitted to inflect the bloodline of Israel as well as the lineage of Christ. This is the answer. Why did God give a command to destroy men, women, and children? The reason? They're not human. There could be no truce. There could be no peace. Well, can't we give them an opportunity to repent? There's no repentance here. This is otherworldly. This fits with everything else you've learned in this class about what happened in Genesis chapter 6. You see how it's carrying forward into the history of Israel. So we come along Genesis chapter 6, we skip right over in our reading, it says in 1-4, oh, the Nephilim were there in those days, and then pff, we're on to the next thing. That's like the beginning of like a very small weed 
and then you get, start digging it up and all of a sudden you've got roots that are going all over your yard. And it takes a lot of time to sort this all out. But every one of these people groups that we discussed tonight that were under the ban, under Karim, were a giant clan. This is the answer why nothing was to be left that breathes. And when it comes to animals in some of these places, again, I call to your attention that there was a concern in a lot of the writings regarding genetic manipulation of animals. In some of these places, nothing was left that could be breathing. Everything had to be put under the sword. Now, I think it's interesting that this lesson ended up on this Monday. Because this is also closest to the Sunday that evangelical churches across the United States celebrated Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. You know, it's the day that commemorated the Roe versus Wade decision in 1973 that legalized abortion on demand, for the most part. Okay? And churches have been making a stand against that since that time. Because of the presidency of Donald Trump, he elected three new judges to the bench, and it was overturned. Okay? Some have said, and I understand where they're coming from, the, the state that we have now, in a lot of ways, is worse than what we had before. Um, a lot, in fact, all of the pro-life gains that have been made over 50 years in the state of Michigan were completely washed away in a tidal wave that came across the sand. There's nothing left of them. It's gone. And Michigan was a model state of the 50 for the progress of the right to life movement. But what you need to understand, we do have sanctity for life, for human life. What you're studying right now is not human. It's otherworldly. And I, it comes from a supernatural understanding of Genesis chapter 6. And it's unfortunate this has been buried for so long. I've put all this together and all this here. There isn't anything that was pulled in and just made up. It's right here in your Bibles. And when you start to have a needle and thread and you stitch all these things together, we begin to see, well, wait a minute. This does fit with what happened in Genesis chapter 6 and another incursion that happened after that. And we see the strategic plan of the powers of darkness here to defend the land that Yahweh wanted for his own. Now, up to this point, all of the lands, all of the lands, including the land of the promised land, were under the dominion of other gods. This is how I'm going to get you back in March. How did they get to be in power? And why is it that Yahweh actually, even though he doesn't condone what they're doing, he respects their purview? Strange. We're going to study that. But on a week that we're focusing on the sanctity of life, we remember that human life is made in God's image. And what you need to understand, what we're studying right now was not made in his image. It was a plan hatched in hell and was realized in the world. It is the backstory behind the scene of the fomenting, the encouraging, the, the abetting of evil in the world. And God took it on head on. In some classes, when you study the Old Testament, particularly Joshua and those other historical books, it's prefaced as Yahweh as warrior. God goes to war with lesser Elohim to destroy them and destroy any vestige of their being present. That's the lesson. Any questions? Over here, Jim.
This is going back to the example you gave at the end of last Monday's question about the beehive sticking your hand into the beehive yeah. going up there. Do you believe when Christ died on the cross, um, rose again, that he actually, um, in his spirit, went to Mount Hermon, faced the gate of Hades there and the devil and said, this is done. You no longer have a place on this earth. Um, no. Where we're Peter says he descended and confronted them in prison. The, the ones that perpetrated this, Jude and Peter say, read it again tonight before you go to bed, God imprisoned them. And Jesus goes there, and the scripture can read, preached, and I think it's actually a proclamation, in their face you failed. And they await their final doom. But do you feel he did it here on earth, or do you feel he did it in the heavenly or the, he the did hellly it, realm? He, he, he did it in the heavenlies. Yeah, somebody else had a hand up. More, um, Dorothy. I probably missed and you explained it, but verse 22, why were they left in Gaza, Gath? And they were left there because the Israelites didn't do what they were told. <laughs> they, they failed to take those cities. They ended up going there, and we will examine in sp the spring the sad story of how one of the tribes that didn't do what it was supposed to do in that area and, and what happened to them as a result of that. Yeah. So th God wouldn't give up on it, though. And that's why David's mighty men, years and years later, finish the job. And when they're done, there are no more giant references in our Bibles. Well, it was in that period of time, you know, D David and his mighty men and the Philistines and dealing with those battles that took place. said you didn't do what I told you to do. Yeah. He brought them back. Yeah, well, he was supposed to kill everything in that whole, yeah, yeah and he didn't follow through. But th they have a long history. I mean, the people of God, can we not identify with this, of not doing necessarily what they're told to do? Yeah, yeah. So when the, the sin first happened, when they came down and originally copulated with women, you have a human, you have a non-human, you have a human with a soul, but when they come together, their prodigy has no soul? It has a soul. It has a soul, and when they die, what happens to them? They wander around. They wander around, and what do we call them? Unclean spirits unholy mixture, bastards, demons. Okay, but they're, they're half in the image of God. I mean, how do you do that? Uh, the, they're, they're not human. You, so let's, let's talk about genetics for a minute. That even when we have a child that's born uh, to us that has handicaps, you know, the chromosomal structure didn't come together just right, it maybe didn't come together just right, but we clearly understand they're human, okay? They don't function well. They may have limitations physically or mentally, but everything is there. With these beings we're talking about, that doesn't fit. It doesn't fit at all. It's not even remotely close. So we don't have any more of them here. We, what we have, Kathy, is we have the remnants of them, which are still floating around here as demons, unclean spirits, because they're, they're caught between two worlds, right? They'll eventually end up in the lake of fire, but we don't have any giants. And the other thing is, somebody asked me, it's like, oh, you know, I was kind of thinking about this the other day. I was going to bed and I was a little worried, you know? I read to you the last time we were together, how many passages in the New Testament that say, Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public display over them, having triumphed over them through him. I mean, they're defeated. They're, they're still around, but the kind of power they once had is not the same. Yes? 
So does that mean they're still f around? They can be a nuisance? They can be a nuisance. They can harass you. There are cases of possession that still happen. But that's non-Christians. That can't. Well, well, wait a minute. Let's, t let's let me. I, well, I, we don't have possession of Christians, but I want you to understand, Christians can really be hammered by these guys. If we look at Revelation chapter 12, it talks about the great red dragon, right, that's thrown down to earth. He's defeated. He tried to kill the child. We know the child is Christ, right? And what does he do? Um, he makes war on her children. Let me, wait a minute, hold on. Let me just get that real quick. I'm not going to do it justice unless I read it. Um, that's chapter 12. It's the end of the chapter. Verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring. And there's no doubt. Who are the offspring? Who keep, who are they? Who keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay. So Satan is there and his minions to lead you into sin and when you do sin, tell you what a wretch you really are mm -hmm. and how you're not worthy of grace. Okay, I have another question. Um, you talked about when Legion went into the pigs and they went over the cliff because they need to be in a body. So they could still be like possessing animals. They could be, but I think the idea that is carried there that when they went over the cliff, I think they blew the brains of the, of the, the poor animals. Oh yeah. Because, I mean, it's not a human body. It's not a human brain. Right. So them being in an actual body of a, an animal, yeah, it could happen, I guess, but I don't think it's n normal. I don't think that they can handle it. Okay, I thought that was cute. Uh, just speculation. The scripture doesn't say, so we just have to speculate, but because of their height, it's abnormal. You're talking six fingers, six toes, on, it's abnormal. Could it, I'm thinking two things. One, could there also be minds, maybe their minds weren't quite right? I don't mean sin-wise, I mean, you know, they were, you know. I, I think there's a lot that's, I mean, we know it was normal for them to be cannibalistic. I mean, well, how, what has to go through your mind to be doing that? I mean, we've got cases of cannibalism, but there are people that are stuck on some cliff with a mountain of snow all around them, and they're, dra they're, they're dying. You know, we have examples of this. This is not a case of that. And also, I'm thinking about them dying out. I'm thinking, okay, these guys are big. You think big and strong. Not necessarily strong. They're just big and funky. And so maybe they were in battle outsmarted outwitted i mean there's some way that we got rid of them and they're bigger than us i i, I think you know this is this is speculation i they are big they're formidable that way but they may not have been as coordinated as a regular human being that's my wonder. david's mighty men i think were guys that were really in good shape and uh were probably <laughs> nimble and they probably figured out a way to deal with them however the people of God that went into battle initially, that were going up in the promised land, and when the spies come back with the initial report, okay, these were people that had been slaves. What do they know about fighting, right? Now, then they all die. And so the second generation are either little kids that came out with their parents or those that were born in the wilderness. They've been nomads for 40 years. And all of a sudden, we're talking about going in and fighting an entire people group to take possession of the land. That in itself is formidable. But then we got these guys of large height. Their presence was just enough to sauce them. But I think after a while, people figured out, well, you know, you can outrun them. Maybe you can do this. You can do that. You know, they're dangerous. I mean, they got weapons that are two sizes bigger than me. I mean, but they, 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 they probably were not as nimble, probably. Yeah. Yeah. You got to remember, I mean, you know, we talk about Yahweh as warrior. I mean, he's going to war against the gods over these people groups. And these guys that we're talking about, these Nephilim, they're on the lowest end of the totem pole, but they're still there. They're as minions. Okay. These, 
seven giant clans who have now died and destroyed, but they're still in the atmosphere. They have nowhere to go. You use the automotive analogy. And each model may have a different feature and different things. So would these clans have specific, if you would, purpose and roles in the spirit world against us? How does Satan orchestrate these clans for different roles in the world? I don't have any problem with that. I think that's likely. We, but we have this one indication. If you remember the story that Jesus told, I highlighted it a couple lessons ago where uh, you know, the, 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 a demon is exercised, okay? It goes out wandering around to waterless places. He comes back, place has been swept clean, right? And the text says, and he brings back seven more evil than he was. So some of them are worse. You know, and you think, well, what's worse than worse? I mean, but, there's some diabolical things. Yeah, Karen. Hold on. Okay. Uh, for uh, one question, you were talking about Satan's influence. Paul actually refers to this in one of the Corinthians where he has a list of sins in people in churches that he says he pray to turn them over, he's yeah. turning them over, over to Satan, to Satan yeah. for the destruction of, of their, their flesh. flesh so that they might be saved. Yes. I mean, and so there's a, an example of the, the, in the covenant of the church, however you perceive that, there are activities that go against that covenant and the solution is, well, you're outside of it and you get what you do. <laughs> no, actually Satan is not punishment, he is kind of cleansing. He's be being used of God to yeah, drive the person exactly. to the end of himself. And, and this gets to the point too of Jesus is talking to demons pre-cross. We're dealing with demons post-cross. Correct. Where all of that, where Jesus says, all power and, and authority, authority in heaven and yeah. earth has been given unto me, therefore make disciples, discipline ones of all nations. So to me, the hopefulness of all of this is I am more confident in what God has already done in my life, around my life, and all the people who I'm connected with, and I'm not fearful of demons that, that, in any way. That is absolutely true. This is why we don't go to bed and worry about things. I mean, because the hand of God is upon us. This is another reason we're coming in here on Sunday morning. <laughs> Let's go to worship. I mean, Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and the powers. I mean, let's, we should be singing to the top of our lungs. Our, our, our bank books should be throwing, we should be throwing money all over the place for the work of the kingdom of God. We need volunteers for this, that, or the other. Sign up. This is it. This is the greatest thing. Gives us peace of mind. Okay, so two, maybe two simple questions. Number one is, could it be because the initial angels that came down were, was it 200 or was it 70? Well, according they to said, Enoch, it was 200. 200, could those be responsible for the different groups that from each angel came a group of these Raphaim? There could be. We, what we're told by some of those intertestamental books that they came down and they actually had uh, their own particular uh, knowledge that they were trying to impart, most of which was bad. So particularized? Probably. Okay, and then the second question would be, okay, so first they come down, so now you've got a spirit and a human coming together, but those then have children and grandchildren and et cetera. So that same genetic, so you'd still have female Raphaim and you'd have male Raphaim pass it down to their children. So that's why they had to kill the children until they had totally annihilated that whole line. Is and this correct? is why you have the prophet saying, I killed them the fruit and the root. Oh, so the fruit is like? The fruits above. The offspring, but the fruit, you know, uh, what they spawn and the root underneath. We got to deal with it, the whole thing. It's gone. You know, this is like, you know, you got a problem with termites, right? So you call up the exterminator. You know, hey, look, you know, you're coming in. This costs a lot of money. Are you going to get the job done? 
oh yeah, we're, we're going to get them all, you know. And they, they have to get them all. I'll give, you, I'll give you a little open thing on this. So we, we, we go to Columbia. We've had three encounters with uh, amoebas while we've been there in the, in the gut. So the medication that they have there is better than what we got here. Okay, they deal with this more. But the medication down there is given in two stages. The first stage they give it to you is to kill everything off that's there. Then you take another med like three weeks later to get the incubi, the things that were small, you know, just growing. It's the second generation, okay? We got to get the fruit and we got to go below the ground. We got to get the root. God was canceling this whole thing out. There is no inconsistency here with the idea of God being loving and being merciful to mankind. This is not mankind. It's not mankind. And that's why it had to be done. Jim, and one more, and then we're going to close it up. Do you feel that this is why angels are actually jealous of humankind? Because we have a redemption, and they have nothing. They have a one and done. We screw up one time, we're done. We're... As humans, we can pray and ask forgiveness if we keep screwing up, screwing up. Well, if they're fallen, yeah, there's no, <laughs> there's no second chance for them. And I think the ones that ha are, le are loyal to Yahweh, they don't understand redemption because they've never been redeemed. They didn't need it, see? And so the scripture said they long to look into these things you know, they long to understand this. I think that's part of the thinking that's there. All right. So, while I'm gone, i give you an assignment. Okay? I want you to reflect on, take a look carefully at Genesis chapters 10 and 11. 10, you'll have to slug it out because you've got a lot of name of people groups in there. Chapter 11, of course, is the Tower of Babel. Remember, by the time you get to the end of the Tower of Babel, that this is the end of primordial history. The very next chapter is Abraham. That begins patriarchal history. Question, as you read that, what was going on with the rest of humanity? I mean, what ha what, why was the whole thing with Abraham? What's going on there? I mean, at one point in time, God's dealing with the whole of humanity, and we get to chapter 12, and it's all about one guy and what's going to spawn from him. Okay? I want you to look at that. I want you to look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, 9, and 43. You will find there's variation in your Bibles on how that is translated. So I want you to look at it from a variety of translations. Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9, and I think it's 43. Okay? I want you to study that. And then I also want you to study Psalm 82. Psalm 82 is where we began. Lesson number two, startling Old Testament text, we were in Psalm 82. I want you to read that, and that's where we're going. See you in March. Lord, we'll